Hi everyone, I'm Lucas Mack and welcome to another episode of The Golden Rule Revolution, where inspiration and purpose come from treating people like people and nothing less. I'm really excited because I got a special guest in the studio today, my precious and beautiful wife, Lauren. Lauren? Yes. Hello. Hello. Am I supposed to be looking into this camera right there? Uh, you can look at me the whole time. And you can <laughs> reference the people watching if you'd like. Oh my goodness. You're nervous. I am nervous. <laughs> Why are you nervous? I'm nervous because um, I realize that whenever I've done something kind of like out there, it has been in a performing type of situation or like when I was a part of broad, when I was broadcasting in broadcasting, mm -hmm. there were lines. Yeah. I had pre-scripted with my producers everything. Mm -hmm. I read it all. I proofed it all a million times. So by the time I was on air where like someone would watch, I felt like I had all the, everything was buttoned up. And... Nope. Even when like performing, <laughs> yeah, you know, you rehearse a routine a million times. So by the time you're going to perform it, you're like, I know I am ready. And like, this is just talking and <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> no talking. script. And I like hate not having a plan and no like outline of what to follow. And so this is why you know, we're a good fit because I hate having a script. When I was in broadcasting, I hated having a script and you so loved having a script. I'm having a glass of wine. Yes. Taking the edge off. That's good. I said, we're just going to have a conversation. And you're like, yeah, like we always have a conversation. But I said, no, like a conversation, not like, you know, not like crosstalk conversation. Right. Crosstalk conversation when you're in broadcast TV is conversation that's supposed to look like off the cuff, but it's sort of staged too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Anyway, okay, enough of that. All right. So, all right. What are we talking about? What well, are we talking you're about? on the Golden Rule Revolution podcast. You've Thank listened you. to a lot of episodes. You've, um, saw me, you've been with me since the beginning of this journey and you've been, you've known me for when I was 22, we met, I'm 38, 16 years. And you've been on this journey with me of healing and expansion and living. Yes. And you've also seen the beginning of this podcast. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a little, oh, we a got little a, man. We got a little, we have a little, a little child, but we got a man, man child. Yes, man child. Some <laughs> for the tree house. Oh, thank, thank you so much, you. buddy. Oh. Yes. This is the Beautiful. Thank you, buddy. I'll, I'll make sure Thanks, I. Uh, also, like, okay. so, like, you can go outside, go across and that. Right so, cool. like, you're going to put a bed in the. Like, that's where you guys sleep. That's amazing. I can't wait oh, to sleep yeah, there. I so forgot sweet. to put the bed in Thanks, Thanks buddy. You know, I like to keep your pictures. Love you, bud. Good night, bud. Can you shut the door all the way? Good Thank night, you. Sweetie. Good night. That was sweet. Well, that's life. That's real life right there. That's real life. So, what I was getting to yes. is Just, you've seen me start the beginning of this podcast, and it's come a long ways. Mm -hmm. Where I was reading a script my very first two episodes. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. And now here we are just sitting talking. Yeah. What has, what has been the most over the past four years specifically in our, our story of healing and, and really healing and mm -hmm. standing in our own power, you becoming you, me becoming me, yeah, not, not being codependent, not, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, not. What's your question? <laughs> my question is. <laughs> married couple. My been qu married for almost 15 years. Yeah. What is your question? My question is. What has the journey been like for you? Oh, gosh. Well, let me take a sip of my wine. No, it's been... Um, <laughs> I really did take a sip of my wine. It's been a very beautiful and scary experience. Hmm. Why? Um, scary because when... I don't even know like where to begin, but basically we've been together for so long and um, I, I've heard before that like couples have a dance together. They have a certain way of being together mm. in relationship and when, and you're kind of used to whether or not it's said out loud or unsaid playing certain roles in the relationship and it really felt like the bottom was starting to drop out when 
you started going through some really, really dark times. And I know that you um, had dealt with depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts before and in the past, but I hadn't, I thought that you had healed from that. So when it sort of reared its ugly head again, so to speak, I was very like ill-equipped and I felt like our, my life was like falling apart. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was grasping at like loose dirt. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't get a hold on what was, I felt like everything that I thought was, wasn't really like, was it a lie? Everything was changing. There was a lot of things that we had been through and a lot of things were coming to the surface and I don't need to go into specifics, but it was very terrifying. I thought, are we even going to be together? Like, I mean, so many times I never, I never doubted that I wanted to be married to you. And like, I always thought we'd be together forever and that we'd be that really old couple that like had that special romance that like lasted for years and years. But when I remember when we were, this was happening, I was like, wow, like I really was off. I had no idea like that this was coming. And so it was just terrifying because it was like, I felt like I had to hold the whole family together because you were not, emotionally available slash Mm -hmm. even physically. Like I felt like you just sort of bowed out, like you were in such a dark space. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a newborn baby at the time. We had two young kids. And I'm really grateful for them and grateful for that because I feel like they kept me going every day. And it was like not one time did I worry that I wasn't going to be able to show up fully for them. I just didn't know how it was going to shake out for us Mm. and for you. And of course, like, I love you so tremendously. Like, it wasn't just about me. It was also about watching someone that I loved so much that I had put up on a pedestal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fall down so hard and being like, oh, my gosh, like, I don't even, like, what is my life? Like, anyway, so. The disillusionment of your ideals. Yes. Yeah. But it was really beautiful because obviously where we are now, like we've elevated and expanded in so many ways individually and as a couple, I I don't think that (laughs) we would have been able to get there if there hadn't been so much pain and hurt and sadness and fear because all of that like... And confusion. Yeah. I I mean, all of that sort of just brought my own issues, I guess, up to the surface as well that I didn't even realize were there. Like, for example, if you're putting your partner on a pedestal and you're not seeing them as like a regular human being that has, I mean, I always did that. And I didn't even realize that I had like codependency type of patterns and because that was just my normal. So anyway, I'm talking a lot on here, but it was just, it's been really intense and it's been really beautiful because where we are today now, like I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it was shitty. (laughs) Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, it's interesting. Like I was, I always showed signs. Like I was, um, I picked my skin terribly and, and I just finished the book educated and one of the book, which by the way, I highly recommend the book educated, but one of the things that I resonated so deeply, I've not even shared this with you, is her looking into the mirror and 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 having this relationship with herself that she saw in the mirror. And I would do that when I pick my skin. I'd look at myself like, "What's wrong with you? Like, you're a smart person. Like, what are you doing?" While I'd be bleeding, and it was just this way. Like, I listened to Lady Gaga's episode with uh, Oprah, yeah. Oprah, and you know, when you cut, when cutting or picking skin, it's the same thing. Like, I was drawing blood every time. Um, it's like it a self mutilation, like, but it also felt better because it eased the pain. Like that pain felt like you didn't have to yeah. feel the other pain. Yeah. And so why I bring that up is, you know, for anyone listening, like there are always signs whether we want to yes. see them or not. That's what I'm saying. Like, I agree with that. There's always signs. It's just and the signs. There's something behind the signs. And when we beat people up about the signs, for me it felt like. I truly could not stop that. I, I couldn't stop that. But then when it was when you kept talking about it, or you know, or growing up, when the things I struggled with, and the the things that were seen got <laughs> picked picked apart, that just made what was not seen even worse. And I think a lot of people probably can relate to that, 
or hopefully. I hope mm-hmm. they relate to that because what we see is not the issue. That's just a symptom or a fruit of the root yeah. that's way deeper. Yeah, and I had no idea. So I was critical <laughs> of things like that. I'd be like, why are you doing that? Like, give yourself a break. Your skin needs to heal, things like that. I mean, because – but also I had no idea. Yeah, I, the, hid. I hid. I hid. I had no it. idea of the depth of the internal struggle you were going through. And mm-hmm. so – All I saw were the symptoms and I feel like, you know, it's, it's not a blame game, but like you didn't let me in to see the depths of that, those demons. And so I, in relationship with you, am operating from what you're communicating to me and what I'm seeing. Like, and I'm not saying that, I don't know. I mean, I feel like when I look back at the time, if I had been more proactive to ask you and pry and like try to go deeper. I don't think that you were in a place that you were ready to be open about what was really going on in the like darks of depth of like depression, depression and anxiety and all that. Like anyway, I, but you're That's right. That's why I like the term hold space. Yeah, I love like, that. Like you really held space for me even though you didn't know that. And instead of us humanity, people trying to force a fix – just hold space and be compassionate and know that yeah. whatever they're going through has nothing. I just shared this on the podcast with, with Blake because um, I recorded. I have another podcast called The Vulnerable Hero Geared Towards Men. It was the very first episode that I had a guest on for that and a guy who's gone through two of the men's retreats. And I said one of the things for women listening and this I said, you know, I have a beautiful wife. Blake has a beautiful wife. Women feel rejected when it has nothing to do with them. Um, it's really, oh. <laughs> yeah, Colin, you can. Go ahead, buddy. Close the door. Good night, Thanks sweetie. Good night. Um, yeah, I see what you're saying. You see what I'm saying? I want to like, add something, though, to that. But wait, let me finish real oh, quick. Oh, okay, yeah. So it has nothing to do with not wanting to be around you or wanted to be, for Blake saying he didn't want to not be around his wife. It was we were avoiding the uncomfortable feeling and we would do anything to avoid that yeah it wasn't a rejection you know that but i'm just saying for anyone listening for specifically and it can feel like a rejection for sure it does because i mean i remember feeling like when things started like very close to where things started surfacing for you um like i felt very distant i remember feeling like very disconnected like all you wanted to do was watch tv um like there was literally yeah, you watch TV all the time. Like you come home, you weren't interested in seeing the kids. Like it was just, it was very like lonely. And I took that as, and then you, I remember you said to me one night, you know, we just don't have the same things in common anymore. You do you, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies? Do you read? And I was like, um, my hobbies are like literally keeping the kids alive right now because Mm -hmm. they are so tiny and Mm -hmm. my hobbies are trying to get as much sleep as I can and maybe work out if I can. But like, I remember feeling like that was a personal like criticism slash rejection. Like it was something that I was doing wrong to drive you to not connect with me Hmm. because I had no idea. So it was really just, I mean, that's the story I made up about the actions and what I heard. Hmm. Oh my goodness. Thanks buddy. Oh, that's very special. Thanks bud. Good night, sweetie. I guess we should have waited till even later to do this podcast. It's okay. But anyway, I wanted to add something about the holding space thing because that is one of the most beautiful, yeah. um, empowering. What would you call that? Like non skills, threatening, non judging skill. Yeah, skills that liberating, we probably picked liberating up skills in the last like um, couple of years or something. Yeah. But I want to say what that is. Go ahead. Okay, so, well, I don't know if I'm going to say it eloquently, but holding space for someone is listening with a compassionate heart, an open heart, with zero agenda on your end to try to fix it, make it better, make their feelings go away or improve their feelings. Um, It's standing in your own power. Oh, that's huge. Is like yeah. not getting taking on their emotions and getting yeah. influence, which was really a huge learning curve for me as well as we began to like go through all of this and like you know, find ourselves and heal more and and really like get to the root of our own stuff and 
because I didn't realize how much like I was a sponge of like taking on like his emotion, your emotions. Mm -hmm. And so it was near impossible for me to hold space for you for a, a really long time because I felt so threatened by if you were having a bad day, then like, what does that mean for our family? And what does that mean mm -hmm. for me? But it's actually a very self-centered, egotistic um, place if you cannot hold space for someone. And maybe, and that's a process. I think it takes your own healing to be able yeah. to hold space because you realize that you are two completely different individuals. Yeah. Even as a married couple, like... That was a huge learning. Huge. Like the whole... The whole um, concept of one and one make three. So one person plus one person, it's not two halves, two halves to make a whole. It's one whole, one whole, and then a third, which is the relationship. So mm -hmm. one and one make three. So that was huge to not take on feelings like a sponge. And, and so I could start holding space for you Yeah. and realizing everyone has their path. Everyone has their healing journey. Everyone has their own emotions and emotions come and go and they're, they're like waves. And so it is safe. It's a safe space to just be there to hold space. And, and I love what my friend, um, I'll give a shout out to Carrie Mon said she, I remember it stuck with me. She was like, hold space instead of fill the space. Hmm. So a really huge thing that it's easy for me. Is like there's like awkward silence. I want to fill it up right away. I want to, mm. you know, say something, make it better or whatever. But holding space just means allowing people to pour their hearts out or their whatever it is, their thoughts out to you, without you filling the space with your thoughts, your emotions, your stuff. Yeah. And then responding from a compassionate, like loving space, as opposed to with an agenda. Yeah, that's good. I don't even know if I'm explaining this. Like, I think that's good. I think that's it. good. I think most people. I think if everyone was aware of what holding space is, would want someone to hold space for them. I think that's a really loving act is I'm going to hold space for you. I'm not going to get drug into your, your pain and your, your trauma. However, I will love you through it and I will hold space, you know, and, and I will create safe space for you to process. That's it. Yeah. It's safe space. So yes. You can process because yes. really, you don't want someone to sit there and tell you exactly what to do. Some, sometimes you just need to hear yourself say things out loud or to unpack your thought process to really start drawing connections to where you can gain some traction to make empowered connections and empowered action for yourself. But yeah, I mean, I'm really grateful that I know about that skill now and I feel really honored when someone is telling me something and I, I feel like I can hold space for them. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, that fills me up as well, and I know that it helps them. So it's a two-way street of connection. I think you're awesome. Thanks. <laughs> um, so we've done we've done a lot to heal individually, and and actually, I think our relationship healed just because our individual. Healed, I agree. Right? It wasn't like we worked on. I, I'm not knocking marriage counseling. Um, in any way, shape, or form, if that's the path that people need to take, that might be the safest place. And I would also say the more you work on yourself and both work on yourself individually and commit to being with each other, that relationship becomes incredible. Yeah. I want to trade a relationship for anything. Yeah, me too. I remember one after this retreat that I went on, I called you and um, I hadn't seen you for a few days after the weekend and I just said to you, I cannot like will success for you anymore. Like I used to carry that so hard for you and like want you to just be as successful as you want it to be. And I just like, it would like grieve my heart to like see you trying so hard on different business things or sales things or whatever you're doing and not mm -hmm. getting the type of traction or success that you wanted. And that was like such a beautiful workshop because I remember when I called you and I was just like, I get to let all of this go. Like, if yeah. you end up doing what you want to do, like, you know what I'm saying? It's just yeah. I had been carrying that burden of, like, trying to fix and trying to make it for you. And instead, I said, we, we talked about, what if we met today? Like, if we met today as two mature adults, I was like, I still, I want to be married to you. You mm -hmm. said you want to yep. be married to me. Oh, heck and yeah. And we're in partnership together, and we want to be in partnership together. Yeah. And coming together as like two evolved adults now, yeah. how do we want to treat each other? What do we want our marriage to look like? What do we want this 
this team to look like as opposed to recycling stories like, oh, well, when we were first married, this, or this is how it used to be, or blah, blah, blah. But starting from now, what are we committed to moving forward, which was super, super powerful. Yeah, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And that that's the difference, I think, between victim and responsibility or leadership. Like, we get to create whatever we want. Um, Our dog's like hacking up a hairball. uh, We have a sweet old, old, old dog. Stanley. And he's deaf. And he likes to sleep on my jacket. I always leave a jacket on the ground. And he cuddles up in it. He's so. cute. Sweet guy. But um, that's the difference between victim and leaders is victims say, well, this is what it used to be and, and rebel. This is how and, like, it will always I, be. Or how it will always be. Or I remember it used to be so good and, as opposed to like, no, what are, what are we creating right now in our lives? Like our one, one of the things that, I mean, I grew up in a incredibly – dysfunctional, insane home. But one of the things that one of the silos of my upbringing was evangelical Christianity. And this narrative of everything's evil, things are going to get you and, and all this stuff. So I grew up thinking like the secret is satanic and and demonic and i love the book the educated because so many the illuminati and all this stuff like yeah. this is how all i the was conspiracy raised all theories. the crazy oh my gosh and um why i bring that up is all that stuff is really powerful like the secret or not being victim like what you think what you create or what you are, what we experience as human beings is what we've created as human beings. Yes. No one brought it to us. We've experienced pain, and when we don't deal with that pain, then things get created. But I'm responsible for dealing with the pain right now, as you're responsible for dealing with your pain right, right. now. And then if we choose not to deal with that pain, well, then there's going to be results of that. And if we choose mm-hmm. to deal with the pain, there's results of that. Yeah. I think a big thing about it is like we go through our lives and you know, trauma happens to everyone. It doesn't have to be something huge that happened to you. Like that's horrible. Like, you know, sexual abuse or, you know, physical abuse doesn't have to be something that big to still have a traumatizing effect on your life. It could be feeling rejection from, you know, kids as you were growing up. It could be a number of things. It doesn't matter. But, um, untethered soul, which is one of such a good book. Oh my Another gosh. book. You read, have to read, read it. it. Read it. Actually, Untethered is my word for 2020. Hmm. Um, I kind of swore in here already, but can I swear one more time? Swore as much I was going to say, like, I wrote it down um, on this folder. I have it in the kitchen. And when I see it, I just think, Untether, Untether. And like when something happens and I feel the like ego in me rise up, I'm like, Untether that shit, Untether, Untether, which means to me, don't be attached to the results. Untether that Untether shit. Untether that shit. Come on. Put it on a bumper sticker. Say it. But anyway. Um, if I had a reading list, top, yeah. top 10 recommended list, that would be number four. What's number one? What's number two and three? Oh, I don't <laughs> number know. Number four? <laughs> it's number four. I'm okay, working I on have my list one. right now. I'm working on my list. The Surrender Experiment, who w- number, is written number five. by Michael Singer. <laughs> Same um, author. Thank you. Written by Michael Singer. Um <laughs> He writes his memoir about, uh, like, how he got to write Untethered Soul. And I actually was even – I loved Untethered Soul. I was even more inspired by The Surrender Experiment because – anyway, that's a whole other podcast. But anyway, both really good books. What I was going to say originally, though, taking it back to the top. Untether that shit. Untether that shit. Taking it back to the top is an Untethered Soul. It talks about when something happens to you um, in your life, an event, an event, The event is neutral. Whatever the story you make up in your head about it, it goes down into your heart. And basically, your mind and your ego start repeating that story. So, for example, let's say you were bullied a lot in school growing up. And you feel rejected. Maybe the story that you created in your mind was, I'm unlovable. And... 
that story can make can have different flavors in your mind, like how it's going to be said. But basically what happens is since it's going on repeat, that narrative, your your heart starts to close. Hmm. And so it goes a little bit into energy, like energy can't go back and forth and everything. And you can't really step into the fullness of who you're created to be because your heart is stuck in a closed state. And you have a lot of, um, I don't know if I'm explaining this well. Jump in anytime. But anyway, what I was saying is, (laughs) what I was saying is, um, what were we even talking about in the first place, though? Well, you were saying come out at neutral, pain. I want to say something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Okay, I'm tracking. I'm tracking. I'm here. Is that um, working through your own stuff is, I think the easiest litmus test when you're thinking about it is what what happened where I felt like my heart started to close a little bit? What happened where I started to shut down? And you can kind of go back through your life. If you start thinking about it, you're like, yeah, that's when I started feeling like, well, shoot, I'm going to do everything myself. Nobody else looks out for me. Mm -hmm. Or shoot, Mm -hmm. I better be perfect in order to be approved of or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And you can start tracking where you started creating these stories that started shutting your heart down a little bit by a little bit. Yeah. I just realized what, why I have a, problem with some of the books that we read. You okay, know what why? I talk about? I'm like, ah, it's not, Yeah. you know, Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. Another, another great book. Another great book, but also for me, too soft. I, I had a really hard upbringing and, you know, I was beat with a bullwhip. That's one thing that happened to me when I was 11 years old. And... Can I add something here? Yes. So when we met, you used to tell me these stories, but you would like laugh about these stories and you'd be like, yeah, I was raised in like super intense and like all like, like a hard household. So I didn't know how hard it was because I was listening to your narrative at the time yeah, and picking that up. So yeah. I just want to add that if you like... The stories that we create around them, like at that time, you were creating a story that, oh, it wasn't that bad. Like it was a rough way to be raised, but like, but at the time you weren't able to, you didn't have all these flashbacks where you were unlocking all these memories and- I never thought, I never had a first person memory. You had gone into disassociation, but like you hadn't started the healing journey, so- Right, but let me, let me get back to my point. Okay. So you explaining untethered soul and coming at things neutral- for the first, for people who have had a, a similar upbringing mm-hmm. to me, I don't like that term. Like everything's neutral, because everything's not neutral. That makes sense. And that's true. And for some things. I do think it's appropriate to say, "What if you approached it as neutral? What's another thing you could say about that?" I like that better. As opposed to this is like landmark forum and different things. Like everything's just a story you put to it. Well, let me beat you. Right. Or if and someone's then, raped. Yeah. Like let, it's ridiculous. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly like, well, let me do this to you. And then you tell me you come out that neutral. That's yeah. a ridiculous thing. It's a non-compassionate way to talk about events. And it is powerful to say, yes, that happened. Yes, it was terrible. And what would it look like if you came at it neutral even though it happened, Mm -hmm. and what can you say about it now? You can say that was the fucking worst thing like ever and get it out of you and it made, you know, you stopped a cycle that was generationally long. So I was strong enough to not pass that on. That's a that's a way to look at it. That's a narrative of, so it's, it's what if you approached it neutral versus everything's neutral. Yeah, I like that better. That's, I think, what I've I've been struggling with this. Lauren reads these books. I read them. Like, God, it's something like doesn't sit right. It's not like it doesn't resonate because it's there's no violence in their their upbringing, so it doesn't speak to me. But that's it. Yeah. It's that not everything's neutral. But what if you approach it as neutral? What's another narrative you can give yourself? Yeah, I like that. as opposed to that. We have another. Oh, we have another. another oh, what else you got for me? I think our son Whoa, does not want to go to so bed. Cool. Hey, Colin, it's bedtime. Good night, sweet boy. Lights off. Yeah, yeah lights, lights off. off. Thank night, you. Buddy. Love you. Sleep tight. I'm gonna keep these. Okay. Thanks, now we buddy. know to start these podcasts later. Oh, we got our family. Oh. Is this our fan? Is this our family? I love it, bud. Okay. Share so it with we got, mom. We got our family there. So cute. It's very cute. Very cute. Got some. We got robot. A robot. We have a robot here. <laughs> A robot with like a, a turtle chicken in or his a stomach. Chicken, perhaps. <laughs> and we got a whole bunch of stars. And, Aww, and stuff. I love it. I love it. I love it. 
Um, but that that's actually a big realization for me. That's hey. what I have an issue with when it's it's like people talking about all sunshine and rainbows like Hey, bro, everything's not sunshine. I'm not saying Michael yeah. Singer says that, but Marianne no. Williamson, for sure, I felt like. Yeah. But that's why it's good to talk about it and just flush for it sure. out. Yeah. That's why it's also fun to read the same books. Yeah, it's true. Although I feel like every book I finish, I'm like, you have to read this yeah. one. This one is <laughs> so good. And then he reads and he's like, mm. No, but okay. educated. Which, educated, delivered. And Untethered Soul, I read that first. Yeah, you got to read, read The Surrender Experiment. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah. So what's the number one book, though? Um, figure that out yet. The number one book. Okay, I'll talk about the book I'm reading right now. <laughs> While you're thinking, um, I'm reading Eckhart Tolle, A New Earth, and that is challenging me in huge ways. Every chapter, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so good. That's so good. You're looking at your books. Yeah, I. There's a lot of different books. I think um, a top 10 would be How Shall We Then Live? No, no, I'm sorry. Where'd it go? Ideas Have Consequences, that's a top 10. Untethered Soul, definitely a top 10. Um, I think Can't Hurt Me, David Goggins, top 10. Um, Because it's very inspiring. I would mix like business, life, philosophy. Yeah, and I would mix like Jessica Simpson's memoir. (laughs) Because I cannot wait to read that and keep it light and interesting, although... A memoir usually isn't that light, but I really am interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Reading's important. Learning and growing. Okay, so one of our coaches, Jenna Mm -hmm. Phillips Ballard. Yeah, shout out. Shout out. We love you. Thank you for being there at the beginning of... JPB. Do you call it your journey? I feel like calling it your journey is like so Bachelor. No. The Bachelor. I would say that was one... No, the beginning of our expansion. Maybe anyway, it doesn't matter. But we both yeah. attended a uh, leadership training in San Diego, and she and her husband Brad own and operate um, Ascension Leadership Academy, and it was hugely momentous and life changing for both of us. But she always says, "You're either green and growing, or you're ripe and rotting, or you're ripe and rotting." So really, there's no standing still. That's right. You can never really just stand still and hold ground. It's you're moving in one direction or another. So either you're pressing in. And growing or, yeah. Yeah. You're rotting. That's Ew. right. Yeah. Nobody wants to rot. No. Although there's some seasons that you're just like, you know what? I just want to watch reality TV and chill. And that's okay. And that's okay, too. You got to give yourself a break, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's just a lot. I mean, yeah. it's a lot to, like, dig into things and feel hurts and review it and try to see connection. and. But also... And, and keep going. <laughs> Also, right? it's really exciting because yeah. you reach a new level of like excitement, joy, freedom in your life. Yeah. Although sometimes getting to that other side is intense and not comfortable. Right. And you're like falling apart. And can I share something else? Yes, of course. Um, something I just shared with a friend, just talking about the expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. And same thing with growing is sometimes you're in a state of total expansion, and just like our hearts expand, contract, expand, contract, sometimes you're in a state of contraction. So you feel really victimy, or you feel like everything's not going your way, or you feel like, wow, I've worked for nothing, like all mm. of this for nothing, yeah. and um, things aren't working out the way that you had hoped. Hashtag life. Untether that shit. Anyway, <laughs> but... um. And then that's a state of contraction. But you have to have the contraction before you get the next expansion. So that's why when you're like digging into all this stuff and I don't even know how to phrase it all, but basically, you know, you're in a state of contraction. So then you can be in the next state of expansion and leveling up in your life. Like jellyfish. Yes, just like jellyfish. That's how they move. Or just like having a baby. Yeah. Uterus. Contract? Yeah. Push the baby out? Okay, I don't know. I wouldn't, anyway. I wouldn't have said that. Well, but that's what my mind went. it's accurate. It is. <laughs> um, so how has your first podcast episode been? This is actually going a lot better than I expected. <laughs> you love it. I should leave. You should just <laughs> take over. <laughs> I am having fun. It is fun. I'm it's getting fun. yeah, I'm getting more comfortable as we're going. It's fun to share and anyone listening, just know that if you're still listening. Yeah. <laughs> this is getting so listening. long. Um you're not alone. You're not alone in life. No matter what you're doing, yeah. you can you can choose isolation and 
certainly have that right, but you are not alone in your circumstance. There are other people going through the exact same thing you've gone through or something so similar that you, when you open up and take your mask off and share what you're going through, in fact, well, I'll finish this thought. It gives other people permission to take their mask off and share what they're going through. For instance, my perception of some guys recently were ego mask and then I had the greatest time talking with these guys and realized, well, this guy's a cool, super cool guy. And, and, um, and so share open, be open, have courage. I shared this on a podcast the other day. I think the lack of self-love is the lack of, is a direct result of the lack of courage in people's lives. Like I don't need hmm. affirmations if I'm doing things that are courageous. I'll feel proud of myself. That's such a good point. You've seen this in me. Like mm-hmm. I do a lot of courageous things. Yeah. And I feel really proud of myself. And when I didn't do those courageous things, I needed that validation yeah. for other people. Like tell me I'm doing a good job versus like, no, I know I'm doing a good job because I did something that most people would never do. Yeah. So I think the lack of self-love is a direct result of a lack of courage or taking courageous steps and actions. So – my yeah. encouragement is take those steps. Well, and I want to cite like everything, a lot of the pieces of media and books and stuff that I read just because I don't own these ideas, but I have taken them on to live them. But um, Lady Gaga was on Oprah's Super Soul Conversation recently, and she talks about taking bite sizes of courage. So mm. if you're listening, you're like, oh, no, well, now I'm going to have to do this if I'm going to be courageous. Like, I don't know what your circumstance is. We're not saying you have to do something crazy huge to build that confidence. It can be bite sizes of courage where you start having more self-respect, like being more proud of yourself, understanding like, wow, like I really am starting to stand up for what I want, what I believe, what I actually am like, my goals in my life and all that. So bite size. I think it's really good. I think that's a really good point. And that is a really easy way, like not maybe easy, but that's a good like shortcut way to start building self-love quickly yes. because every day yes. we have we have a million choices all throughout our day yes even when you just go to eat like hey you could have that deep fried cheeseburger and fries whatever or with a huge shake yeah or you can decide to feed your body something healthy that's like fuel you can use now that's mm-hmm. not saying you're gonna have not never have a burger and fries again but it's just it's if that's something that you always choose like the less healthy option then that helps you maybe build more confidence in yourself. And you're like, I'm nourishing myself today. I'm giving myself the gift of nourishment. I'm taking care of myself. Hmm. I've never thought of food like that. Courageous not to do that which is easy to do. Oh, my gosh. And even shout out Brene Brown. Like I said, I'm going to name drop people as I've taken and I've learned from so much of what they've had to share just in the world. But talking about even with – women and friendships and like how gossip is the fast food of connection. Hmm. And that's the same thing. Like the fast food of lunch, the fast food of connection is gossip. So if you are having the courage to maybe like you're in a situation where there's a lot of gossip being said, if you take that little bite-sized courage to decide to not participate in that, Hmm. then you build confidence there and you don't engage in fast food connection. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Well, we did it. I think we did it. I wonder how long this is. Oh, it's long enough. Um, Thank you, everyone, for listening. My name is Lucas Mack, and... I'm Laura Mack. And this is the Golden Rule Revolution, where inspiration and purpose come from treating people like people and nothing less. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us in this conversation. And I look forward to having many more. Yes, love it. All right. Talk to you soon. (laughs)